the long white beauty that started it all. The N1 rocket inside which sat Sputnik 1, the first ever man-made satellite to reach Earth orbit. So as we fire her engines and lift her off the surface, it should be noted that the N1 was the first example of rocketry in that the whole exceeds some of its parts. Traditionally at the time, rockets were viewed as a single vehicle with a single engine or single cluster of them. But in this case, it is multiple clusters designed to be separated. The idea of course was, if you need to travel a long distance, the amount of fuel required increases exponentially, because for every pound of ship you add, you must add several pounds of fuel. But the idea was proposed that if you design the ship in parts, and when part of fuel is expended, you can cut that part off, you reduce the mass and the size of the vehicle, requiring less thrust to push less weight the rest of the way. In fact, the R7, as we see it, is the basis for every Russian manned spacecraft that has ever flown, and is still used in fairly the same manner today as the Soyuz. So from 1957 all the way to today, the R7 proves itself as the most efficient launch vehicle of all time. As for the beginnings, a lot of people think that Sputnik was a shocking surprise launch that no one ever saw coming and triggered the beginning of the space race. This is actually not true. The space race began, or rather the push for space, began an announcement around 1950. In which case, about a year from the middle of 1957 to the middle of 1958 would be devoted to Earth sciences studying microgravity, radiation, temperature, studying the Earth from higher than ever before. And this was called the International Geophysical Year. Similar to the International Polar Year of decades prior. And multiple nations would cooperate and pool their resources. As the engines prepare to cut off, we see arguably the most pretty staging of spaceflight and those four boosters just drop away. And the, leaving the core module of the R7 to continue its journey. Now as for Sputnik itself, originally in its design, they'd intended to send up a scientific research package including temperature sensors, radiation sensors, gravity sensors, the whole shebang, but it proved too big and too heavy and finally, they just decided to go for the political prestige and just get something up. And so Sputnik itself was essentially just a radio transmitter with a polished metal shell, a polished chrome shell that could be easily seen from orbit. And the beeping sounds of Sputnik were, of course, heard loud across the Earth in every nation. Now, a launch would generally be determined mathematically and work out to where it could achieve its stable orbit with one engine burn precisely controlled. But in Kerbal Space Program, we're flying by the seat of our pants, so... I have to basically wait until I reach my apogee to round out my orbit. So the launches here will not match their historical counterparts as much as the vehicles themselves. 
as our perigee leaves the atmosphere, and we are now in orbit. The nose cone breaks away, and Sputnik itself separates. Beginning its signal, and its polished surface could be seen from the Earth. However, this actually was not the case. Its signal was heard, but what people actually saw was the spent booster stage. But that hardly matters, because the goal had been met. However, America was not about to take this lying down. For their own program had to continue, and after a successful launch of Sputnik 2, first the Navy got their chance with the Vanguard rocket, but it blew up after rising only about four feet. The second go was Explorer 1, developed by famed German rocket scientist Werner von Braun. And this is the Juno 1 launch vehicle, with Explorer sitting on top. And it is the same basic design throughout the Redstone family, and we will see more of Redstone next time. Unlike the R7, the Juno 1 was in fact a single vehicle with a single engine. But Von Braun, essentially being the father of modern rocketry and having worked on the, the V2 rocket program through World War II for Germany, he was pretty much the expert on how to make a, sa a stable single-engine rocket. So this was, well, it was a challenge, but comparatively no real challenge for him. Sitting on top of Juno is Explorer, the little nose cone. And unlike Sputnik, it actually had several scientific uh, measurement devices on board, including its famed uh, radiation detectors developed by Dr. James Van Allen. And these detectors would discover a belt of radiation surrounding the Earth, which would thereafter be named for the scientists who developed the detection methods. And thus they became the Van Allen Radiation Belts. And successive Explorer probes would chart this region in greater depth, as well as the Vanguard when it began to fly. And as fuel cuts off, we separate and the solid motors of the remaining rocket fire. Now, Vanguard did eventually fly, but Explorer got up first for America. But then the Russians weren't about to end their program either, as the third Sputnik contained the scientific package they'd originally intended for Sputnik 1. And it would also contribute to mapping of the radiation belts. First cluster stage of solid rockets exhaust. And the second stage pulls free from the middle. And we're roughly at decent altitude here. Firing stage two. So all in all, the international geophysical year was a success. And several fields of Earth sciences and other study was successfully conducted. And both the prominent nations involved in rocketry had sent up their respective spacecraft. And just like Sputnik, I will have to try this manually. Separating from the final stage, and now giving us the last boost. 
Now, there were no communication satellites at the time, obviously, because these were the first, nor were there networks of ground stations to track the vehicles from the ground. So after Explorer 1 had launched, the only way they would know that its mission was complete was that it completed its orbit and they were able to detect it from the ground. However, after the expected 90 minutes of orbit had passed, all they'd gotten was silence. And it would be quite a while before the signal reappeared as we extend our antennas and get the familiar explorer. What had indeed happened is that its orbit was much farther than they had anticipated and it took longer to come around. Which not only made Explorer more successful than they had anticipated, but allowed it to actually reach into the radiation belts. And so, thanks to Explorer and Sputnik, the very beginnings of space scientific study had begun, and both nations then began to work feverishly on developing their manned program. And that is what we will get into next time. We will proceed with NASA's Mercury space program with the Redstone and the Atlas. I am K1, and thank you for tuning in to this first episode of Kerbal Odyssey here on CIMAX TV, the sci-fi view of the universe. And we will see you next time.